Hi, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome everyone here with us today. My name is Sunny Kim. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Harriman Institute in Columbia University. I welcome all of you here taking part of our third session of the speaker series, Role of Law and Autocracy, the Legal Dimension of Russian Politics. Uh, you can find more information about the event in the Harriman Institute website. For today's session, uh, we have Dr. Ben Noble from joining us from the UK. Dr. Noble is an assistant professor in Russian politics at University College London, School of Slavonic and East European Studies. He is also an associate fellow at Chatham House and a senior research fellow at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, Russia. Um, his research mainly focuses on Russian domestic politics, including intra ally dynamics and legislative politics. He's also interested in parliamentary politics and their authoritarianism beyond Russia. His work has appeared in numerous academic journals, such as in Comparative Political Studies, the Journal of European Public Policy, the Journal of Legislative Studies, Russian Politics, and Post-Communist Economies. Uh, in today's talk, Dr. Noble will share with us his research on the influence of intra-executive conflict uh, manifested in lawmaking and policymaking and how the legislative body as an institution is used distinctively by the executive elites in their policy making process in today's Russia. So today, as usual, followed by the uh, presentation, we will have the Q&A and discussion time. Uh, those who have comments and questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function in the Zoom during and after the talk. So without further ado, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Noble to take the floor. Thank you, Dr. Noble, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Sunny. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thank you very much for putting together such a great speaker series. I really do feel very privileged to be uh, speaking in a series with such distinguished scholars. So thank you very much. Uh, you can see my first slide if you can. If I see a nod from you, Sunny, then I'll I'll get going. So. Bulldogs in the Duma, uh, maybe quite an odd title, but I will make it clear during the presentation why it has such an odd title. And let me get cracking. This is going to be a talk about authoritarianism and law in Russia. And I've taken my brief quite seriously. I've stuck to the language that Sunny um, has written for this speaker series about the questions that the series wants to engage with. And the way that Sunny sets up the issues that are uh, addressed by the speakers in the series, I'm going to draw on that language explicitly, although with a few tweaks. So the conventional wisdom in scholarship has been that institutions in authoritarian systems in general, but also in Russia in particular, uh, uh, they're mere instruments of autocratic rule. So we're not looking at quote unquote real political institutions in the way that we might think that they would function in democratic societies. So that's the conventional wisdom, but more recent work uh, uh, would push back against that and say, well, that actually these institutions should be taken a bit more seriously. And in fact, they can sometimes resemble the functioning of their namesakes in democracies. And the third point, which I was particularly pleased to see in Sonny's write up for the speaker series is this, and that's to what extent do lawmaking bodies, including uh, the state Duma, which is the body that I'm gonna be focusing on in this presentation, to what extent do they have autonomy from central politicians? To what extent can they carry out their activities without performing to a script written by the executive. So that's the setup of the speaker series, but it's also explicitly the setup for my presentation. Now I'm focusing on the State Duma, as I said, but maybe some of you will be thinking, well, this is going to be a very short presentation because we know the answer already that the State Duma doesn't have autonomy. That in fact, this image concept, uh, puts together, summarizes very neatly the impression that we have of the State Duma, that it's a place of really little meaningful activity. When deputies show up, they're there just as bodies uh, uh, to fulfill a certain script or maybe even to sleep. When they're slightly more active, it could be that they are uh, 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 passing through lots of repressive legislation quickly and with very little scrutiny. And you'll see here this Medusa write up of the flurry of legislation that we saw at the end of 2020 uh, that had very worrying implications for numerous areas of politics and society uh, in Russia, um, but including, and I'd say specifically in relation to the media and also opposition 
actors. 2020, also the year in which the pandemic affected lawmaking. And I think there we saw in autumn, uh, the state Duma coming into its own as a rubber stamp body, as passing things with very, very little discussion. In fact, so little discussion that the Speaker of the State Duma, Václav Volodin, told off some committee members for not making it seem as though Parliament was actually going through the motions and discussing things seriously. Uh, uh, 2020, also the year in which the constitutional changes were implemented and we saw the, uh, again, another flurry of legislation for the implementation uh, legislation for those constitutional changes and in this article with Nikolai Petrov I speak about that implementation legislation but also uh, how it relates to these conventional understandings about what the state Duma does. So that's the anecdotal lead so to speak for this presentation. Let me now give an overview of what I'm going to speak about for the next 25-30 minutes. I'm going to be presenting information that forms part of a book project but I've also published uh, parts of the research in an article in Comparative Political Studies last year and I touch on uh, that also with a co-authored article in the same issue with Jennifer Gandhi and Milan Svolik where we talk more generally not just specifically about Russian politics but also about parliaments in non-democracies. So the first question that I'm going to tackle in the presentation is how much like an ideal type, uh, 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 an ideal type rubber stamp parliament is the Russian state Duma? Is the conventional wisdom correct? Um, are people correct in saying that there's no point listening to this presentation because you already know the answer. The second question is, well, if we find some deviations in the state doer's behavior beyond it being a rubber stamp, then what can that tell us about the relationship between the legislature and the executive in Russia? And then the third uh, issue that I'll address is stepping uh, away, zooming out from those specifics. What can uh, these deviations from uh, the rubber stamp ideal type by the state Duma tell us uh, more broadly about the role of law, the practice of lawmaking and politics more generally in Russia. So I've already shown this picture of the sling deputy or at least a deputy who's resting his head while in the main chamber of the state Duma. Uh, and let me just, uh, in case you're not convinced that this is a conventional wisdom, in case you think this is just a straw man that I've put together for the purposes of this presentation, let me now draw on a couple of instances of people making this point that actually really the state Duma isn't worth studying. And we have a mixture of voices, both from within Russia and also from outside of Russia. So we have some Russian political commentators saying that it's not a real parliament, that all important decisions are taken elsewhere. We have a state Duma deputy, in fact, saying that uh, the state Duma is a controlled body. It's not a real parliament. It just stamps decisions uh, taken already by the executive. And then we also have some Western political uh, scientists. So Brian Taylor saying that when bills pass through the Duma, it's not an opportunity for parliamentarians to influence the content of those uh, bills. Um, uh, that's just not what this body does. And then finally, uh, Thomas Remington making a very similar point that when bills pass through the state Duma, there isn't an opportunity for legislators to influence, to affect that policy. And these specific references to the state Duma accord with a more general scholarship on authoritarian politics and what parliaments are supposed to do in those policies. And that is that they're just there to rubber stamp government initiated legislation. And certainly when looking at the partisan composition of the modern day state Duma, it can be easy to see why people think that it isn't in fact going to push back against the executive. It isn't going to show autonomy and be critical of initiatives submitted by the government and the president. Here we have all 450 seats of the State Duma presented with parties and colours. So the Communist Party in red, then a Just Russia in yellow. The dark blue is United Russia and there is a supermajority. So more than two thirds of the seats are held by United Russia. And then on the right, the light blue um, is the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia and those seats. And so we can see if United Russia, uh, a party created by the Kremlin, has a constitutional majority, then we can expect to see a unity of purpose, very little autonomy of uh, parliament when it comes to the scrutiny of executive policy. And in fact, only a couple of days ago, Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, said that he admired the unanimity that we see within the state Duma. So it's not something for the Kremlin to be ashamed of. 
to say, oh, we, we have this awkward relationship with a parliament that isn't a real parliament. No, Patriarch Kirill is saying we need to be proud of this. This is a sign of unity and unanimity within Russian society more broadly. If we want to step away from this general statement, we can look at uh, um, uh, uh, an initiative that has passed through the State Duma recently. So this is Russia withdrawing from the Open Skies Treaty. And in this reporting from BBC News Russian, it's reported that the State Duma adopted this particular initiative unanimously. And uh, we can check that by going to the State Duma's online database. And we can see that, yes, in fact, when we look at this pie chart, um, the vast majority of the pie chart is green. So people voting for the initiative, there are no votes against. And the only reason why we see that little wedge in gray is because deputies weren't present uh, for that particular session. So yes, this is an example of an initiative introduced by the executive passing through the State Duma and being adopted unanimously. So with these examples, in this research and the research that I present more broadly in the book project, I say, OK, if the State Duma is referred to as a rubber stamp, then let's think in a slightly more systematic way about what an ideal type rubber stamp parliament would do, what it would look like how it would behave. So we'd imagine that all bills introduced by the executive would pass through very quickly with no critical debate. We'd also imagine that the initiatives introduced wouldn't change as they pass through because we just see deputies applauding, voting for unanimously these initiatives. Uh, and I just made that point about unanimous voting being another feature of this ideal type rubber stamp legislature. We definitely not expect to see executive sponsored bill failing to become law. Uh, that would just be a, a shocking instance in this uh, ideal type rubber stamp parliament. And finally, we definitely not expect to see executive officials who, for example, give a speech in parliament to be grilled, to see any type of critical oversight. So these are the expectations for the ideal type uh, rubber stamp parliament. Uh, in an authoritarian policy. But when we take that ideal type and then look at what the state Duma actually does, we don't get that picture. We don't, it's very difficult to map the ideal type uh, rubber stamp parliament onto the state Duma in particular. Some bills introduced by the executive take years to pass through. Some of them see extensive changes uh, numerous amendments made to them between introduction and exit from Parliament. Unanimous voting, I provided an example of it for Russia withdrawing from the Open Skies Treaty, but actually when you look at the voting data, unanimous voting is quite rare. Truly unanimous voting is quite rare, I should say. And perhaps most shocking of all, sometimes executive sponsored bills fail to become laws, including presidential initiatives. Sometimes they fail to become laws. And finally, sometimes executive officials, when they're in the state Duma to give speeches, they face some difficult times, some awkward questioning, some needling. Uh, and in this presentation, I'm not going to focus on all of these areas. I'm going to focus in particular on amendments made to executive bills as they pass through the state Duma. So the question is, why do we see these deviations from the ideal type rubber stamp when uh, looking at what the state Duma actually does and not just resting on this conventional wisdom, these general statements? Well, could it be that actually the state Duma is more democratic, more meaningful, more autonomous from the executive than we've given it credit for? Uh, and could it be that even if it's not democratic, that this is a sign, these deviations are a sign of co-opted uh, opposition actors having an influence on the lawmaking, the decision-making process. And this is a, a picture of co-optation of the opposition that we see in uh, Jennifer Gandhi's work. So these are some of the questions, these are some of the sort of basic hypotheses that we might have as to why we see these deviations. Before I go on and speak about the amendment process, for those of you who aren't familiar with how a bill becomes a law in Russia, let me give you a lightning speed introduction. So this is an infographic uh, providing information on the stage of stages of consideration of initiatives that they pass through the Duma. So working from left to right, we see an initiative introduced, then it will pass through three readings, 
uh, which will involve plenary sessions as well as committee sessions to scrutinize uh, the legislation. And it's at the second reading that's the really crucial reading. That's when amendments can be introduced to initiatives. If uh, these initiatives pass all three readings, then bills go to the Federation Council. If the Federation Council says yes, they go to the president. If the president says yes, then initiatives are passed into law. So that's a very, very quick introduction. And I'd be happy to talk in more detail about uh, the nuances and the specificities of the process in Q and A. So now that you have a broad idea of when amendments can be made in, in the process of lawmaking in the State Duma, let me focus on a case study this is Bill 293332-6, which was two pages long when it was introduced into the State Duma way back on the 7th of June 2013. And when it was introduced, it was a very, very simple bill that uh, changed some language regarding the registration of aircraft in Russia. However, when this bill was adopted in third reading, it was now no longer two pages long, it was 65 pages long. And it now touched on lots of different areas relating to taxation. So it was not only much longer, it touched on conceptually different areas of Russian legislation. Um, so really the question, tapping into the uh, starting point uh, of Sunni's uh, speaker series briefing is, is this a sign of autonomy? Is this a sign that deputies are amending executive in, uh, uh, sponsored initiatives in order to bring them closer to their ideal points, in order then to be able to uh, vote them through and to pass them through parliament? In order to answer that question in this research project, I collected the texts of all bills introduced by the government and the president in Russia between 2003 and 2013. I collected both the text of the introduced bills as well as the final laws. The reason why um, 2003 to 2013, because that allows us to look at a period where we have a freer period, say from 2003 to 2007, and then a much less free period from 2007 to 2013. So we can capture political differences, different levels of freedom, uh, different partisan compositions of the state Duma, and that will allow us um, uh, to vary certain features and to see what effect that has on the state Duma's behavior. But also the reason why I'm focusing on executive sponsored initiatives is because they're the ones that we imagine to be rubber stamped. And also by looking at these initiatives, we can uh, more broadly look at executive legislative relations. With that time period and focusing on initiatives introduced by the government president, that results in 1,150 uh, bill law dyads. And what I did, one of the things that I did was I looked at the text difference between the introduced bill and the final law to look at, in a crude way, the unique word frequency differences between the two, which can give us a very, as I say, crude sense of whether and by how much these texts are changing. So let me give a quick summary of the findings. The most important start, as at least to start with, is to say that bill texts very often change significantly during state Duma passage, that the lack of change really is the minority, that change is um, uh, the main message when we look at what happens to bills as they pass through. In this earlier freer period between 2003 and 2007, we can explain some, part of the variation in the extent to which the text changed by looking at how involved parliamentarians are in scrutinizing these bills, uh, all else equal. So this is controlling um, uh, for a number of other Factors. But then when we look at this later period from 2007 to 2013, there is no longer an association between the level of uh, deputies uh, scrutiny uh, of bills and the extent to which these bills are changing. So something else in this later, less free period must be driving amendments made to executive sponsored bills. Now, as some of you will probably be already thinking, by looking at basic text change, that's a very crude measure. And we can't really tell uh, between when we see a bill, for example, moving from two to six, five pages, and that just being lots of fluff, lots of very uh, insignificant language versus the introduction of one word into a two page document and that entirely changing um, uh, the, the meaning, the thrust of an initiative. So certainly this approach has its limitations, but that's why in the book project, as well as this um, quantitative analysis, 
of the bills, I also include case studies that can drill down into the specifics of certain bills to work out whether the changes are significant or not, but also to explore why these bills are changing. So why do we see bill amendment? Well, one of my main messages is that in order to understand bill amendment, we shouldn't be looking at state Duma deputies, we should be looking at executive actors. So this is a, a rather historic picture of uh, a meeting of the cabinet of ministers. You'll see that Dmitry Medvedev is still sitting at the head of the table as prime minister. But my message really is to uh, all executive actors. So we can think about relations between ministries, between executive agencies, uh, between uh, different uh, factions within the presidential administration. We know that executive actors do not share the same policy preferences in all areas. And we know that sometimes those policy differences can rage on for years and years. See, for example, the work by Stephen Fortescue on the law on subsurface resources, really uh, uh, long battles between executive actors. Yes, they're executive actors, but also executive actors can serve as proxies for broader societal interests. So this isn't just a, a narrow cliquey game, it can reflect um, broader battles in society. Uh, but it's been assumed that these battles can rage on and rage on and rage on. But if uh, executive actors, if say the government or the president decide to send the bill to the Duma, that's because these battles, these disagreements have been ended, they've been resolved. And we can understand why executive actors would want to resolve these disagreements before sending an initiative to the State Duma, because they don't want to air their dirty laundry. Uh, I include numerous quotations within the book manuscript of Putin making it abundantly clear that he does not like it generally when uh, dirty laundry is aired. He wants to make it seem as much as possible uh, that members of the executive um, are disciplined and even if they have their disagreements, they can be in control of when they air those disagreements. So this is my uh, basic, this is the basic thrust of the argument of the book, that in order to understand what's happening of interest in the state Duma, we have to look at intra-executive differences. Um, we have to look at executive factionalism. And so let me apply what I've just said to a basic diagram of the lawmaking process. So here we have this first blue box where we have executive decision making, some of these raging battles, these disagreements that can sometimes go on for years. But we have this hard constraint, this red line, that we won't see an initiative moving uh, from left to right um, without these disagreements being resolved, being ironed out. And only at that point will an initiative be sent by an executive actor to the state Duma, and then uh, the bill can pass through the stages that I've shown before. What I say uh, very broadly in my book is that these intra-executive disagreements can spill over into the state Duma stage of lawmaking. And that's the reason why we see these deviations from the ideal type rubber stamp. It's not a sign of legislative autonomy. It's a sign of intra-executive disagreement. And let me uh, give a few more details about why I think we have to focus on executive factionalism. The reason why we see this red line not actually acting as a proper red line is because executive actors face uh, real problems in the intra-executive sign-off process, the Saglasovanyi process. So this is the process that isn't particular to Russia. Uh, uh, we see it in I would say every political system where you have uh, an executive thinking about whether to send an initiative to parliament. It's the process whereby even if a draft bill is crafted within a certain ministry, that ministry can't just independently send it to parliament. It will have to get the sign off from its executive colleagues in order to prevent uh, ministerial drift in order to prevent that ministry from crafting uh, a, a policy that the its its fellow executive actors don't agree with, and in principle, uh, in in Russia certainly, for uh, bills to pass from the government or from president, they need to go through this Saglasovanie process. However. There are distinct limitations that face, for example, cabinet members when scrutinizing these initiatives that are crafted within a certain ministry. 
uh, ministers, executive actors face uh, constraints of time, resources, but also policy expertise. And all of those taken together mean that it's, it's not always possible for executive actors to monitor for, to challenge, and then possibly to amend initiatives that they don't agree with before these initiatives are sent to the state Duma uh, uh, and uh, to carry on in the logging process. And because of those uh, difficulties, that's why we see the possibility of this spillover taking place. Uh, so spillover, um, I expand on that in much more detail as uh, uh, it won't be uh, difficult to imagine in the book projects and I'm happy to talk about that more in Q&A as well. But that's the, the basic picture. We can explain these deviations from the ideal type by looking at differences between executive actors. Uh, so let me give a very quick summary of what I've said so far, that bill change is the message. It's not the minority, it's not the exception that we shouldn't be looking to deputies in this 2007 to 2013 period as the source of these deviations. Uh, and so it really, this isn't evidence of the State Duma acting autonomy, uh, autonomously from the executive. Really, this is an indication of differences within the executive and these disagreements spilling over. And that means that by studying the legislative stage of policymaking, we can get a window onto intra-executive policy conflicts that are very often hidden or that are obscured. And that is why the title of this presentation, but also of my book project is Bulldogs in the Duma, because as I imagine uh, lots of you all already have guessed, this relates to the quotation that's attributed to Winston Churchill, although I've been told by experts, he probably didn't actually say it, but anyway, attributed to Winston Churchill, saying that Kremlin intrigues are comparable to a bulldog fight under a rug, an outsider only hears growling, and when he sees the bones fly out from beneath, it is obvious who won. So the bulldogs here are these different executive actors who have policy disagreements. And it's bulldogs in the Duma because we see these disagreements spilling over into the state Duma stage of lawmaking. If you don't like the bulldogs um, approach, then I can easily shift to the battle between the towers of the Kremlin as another way of trying to convey that sense that there are factions within the executive in Russia. And what I try to do in the book is to show how those factions can drive um, behavior of interest in the state Duma. So that's the executive factionism story. But there are other reasons why we see non rubber stamping activity in the state Duma. In the book manuscript, I make the case that the executive factionalism story is really good at explaining executive bill failure. It's really good at explaining why it can sometimes take bills so long to pass through the state Duma, uh, as well as uh, explaining bill amendment. But we might have to look elsewhere uh, for um, uh, explaining non-unanimous voting, as well as executive actors being grilled when they're in the state Duma. Uh, and then also, I've been speaking so far about executive sponsored initiatives, but what about initiatives that are sponsored by non-executive actors? So let me begin with voting. Uh, here we have an example of a vote that isn't all green. You'll see the pie chart has a chunk in red. And that's because the Communist Party for this bill that was one of the constitutional reform implementation bills, they voted against. Uh, and I, I wouldn't want to tell an executive factionalism story to explain uh, these votes against. This is a sign of the Communist Party being a member of the systemic opposition, but maybe also flirting with going off script with uh, pushing back against the constitutional reforms that we saw in 2020. So sometimes what we see in the state Duma is maybe a sign of something that is much more in line with Jennifer Gandhi's co-optation model. So that's for voting. What about grilling ministers? Well, in this very famous example from 2019, the then Minister of Economic Development, uh, uh, Dmitry Oreshkin, was giving a presentation on his ministry's activities. And he was interrupted by the Speaker of the State, Duma Vyacheslav Alodin, and he essentially told him, uh, you haven't been good enough. You have to come back and talk to us when you've done 
your homework. So what's going on here? Is this another sign of executive factionalism? Well, I think actually no, part of it has got something to do with the particular individuals involved and one individual uh, specifically, Vyacheslav Alodin, clearly a very ambitious individual who was at the time and still is carving out the state doom and trying to turn it into his own fiefdom. But also it relates to the fact that this isn't Putin giving a speech within the State Duma. This is Areshkin. And so uh, the type of executive actor is going to be important in explaining how the Duma responds to them, how they react to them, how they treat them. What about uh, bills that aren't sponsored by the executive? Well, by far the most initiatives that pass through the State Duma um, are introduced by deputies themselves. This is a graph that shows the share of bills that are introduced by different uh, types of actors. And we see the solid line on the top, the, the black line is for state Duma deputies and the other types of lines relate to um, regional legislatures, but also the Federation Council, the president, the government, and so on. But even though state Duma deputies are responsible for the largest share of introduced draft laws, uh, their success rate of those draft laws are much, much lower for the, for them for the executive. Um, the vast majority of the executive initiatives will become law, although, as I mentioned previously, looking at bill failure actually provides a fascinating window into intra-executive disagreement. But when comparing the executive to state Duma deputies, state Duma deputies um, have a lower success rate as I said. Uh, but this, we're getting closer to the executive factionalism story when looking at at least a significant proportion of bills that are sponsored by deputies. And that's because um, uh, there is extensive evidence that lots of these initiatives aren't actually drafted by deputies, they're drafted by executive actors, by agencies, by services, sometimes by ministries. And one of the reasons why they'd want to do that is because these executive actors wouldn't want to have to go through the sign-off process, the Seguasavania process, because they think it would an initiative would be held up there. So they go to a state Duma deputy proxy to get their initiative into the lawmaking process. Uh, so that's um, uh, one way in which actually the executive factionalism story can be helpful for explaining uh, uh, another type of deviation from the ideal type rubber stamp. So what's the broader significance of all of this? Um, let me uh, reference Dmitry Medvedev and his famous, infamous 2008 statement that without exaggeration, Russia is a country of ne illegal nihilism. One response to that point is that we just shouldn't bother with studying formal political institutions like laws and lawmaking in Russia because they're peripheral to Russian life. Really what we should be doing is focusing on informal practices uh, and other types of behaviors that are gonna give us a better purchase on how Russian politics actually works. But I think my research shows that it can actually be worthwhile studying legislative processes and institutions more broadly in Russia but that isn't because these institutions are behaving necessarily like their namesakes in democracies. Uh, at least for the state Duma, it seems to matter, not because it's uh, a body that's autonomous from the executive, but it provides another venue for executive actors to hash out, to negotiate, um, uh, to uh, disagree, to squabble over differences in policy preferences. And we can think about that as a manifestation of pluralism without accountability. And then let me step back even further and think about, well, what does all of this tell us about the roots and roles uh, of law in Russia? Well, by looking, at, by noting the fact that executive actors in Russia spend time, effort and resources in battling over what ends up in these laws, um, it suggests that the content of laws do matter. Uh, that they're important for the actors involved. And so we can't just say, oh, well, nobody respects law in Russia, so nobody cares about it. People do care about it. And we can tell that by looking at the behavior of actors, including during the state Duma stage of lawmaking. So law matters, even if it isn't for the realization uh, uh, of the rule of law, maybe it's for the realization of rule by law. So that's focusing on the executive elite, but also by looking at societal opposition to certain oppressive legislation that we've seen certainly 
uh, uh, recently, and as we saw at the end of 2020, that also clearly shows that these laws have consequences. Uh, but again, even if not for the realization uh, of the rule of law. And in fact, I touch on that in a bit more detail in a co-authored book that is forthcoming. It should be available through Oxford University Press in the States in September, where we look at Navalny and his movement, and we look at the various legal steps that have been taken against him and his movement. And so we can tell just by focusing on one individual, how a focus on laws and uh, formal institutions more broadly in Russia really is important. We can't just say none of this matters. Uh, and that's really the point that I want to end on, uh, that I don't feel as though I'm wasting my time by focusing on the State Duma, because we can see how these bodies function in a way that means that they matter even if they don't matter in a way that we would uh, recognize by focusing on democratic politics. So thank you all very much for watching and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, it was really useful and an insightful look into how actually the lawmaking works in Russia inside the Duma and how executive actors are fighting and negotiating um, with each other. Um, so I like to, maybe I can just start off asking a follow-up question. I'm really interested in your work actually, because I've been studying the, uh, oppressive and repressive law against the civil society and how that laws were, um, taking impact on, um, the situation in Russia. And I think, um, so one first uh, question is, about the motivation of the executive actors to launder their um, mm. dark laundries on, out on public. And you said there is like a motivation because there are time and resource limitation and the policy expertise and they were having a difficulty in um, having a conclusion and resolving all the conflicts before the pre-legislative process. But I wanted it to, um, I wanted you to elaborate more, maybe what is the concrete benefit of like this one executive actors or the group of uh, people who want to kind of um, hold the place in the first reading without any detailed text of the law and then come up with a very detailed um, legislation at the end of the third reading. I just want to kind of understand from the perspective of the one who kind of hold the place in the Duma and say that, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. And uh, this is more maybe beneficial for me to have my way of uh, the law in the end of the whole process in Duma than resolving conflict before it gets to Duma. So I want to understand what is what is the actual the motivation and the concrete benefit that I can get as the executive actor to um, get my way through the end of the whole bill uh, making process? Thanks, Sonny. Great question. And it's certainly a dimension of the presentation of sorry of the research project that isn't in the presentation. I gave a, 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 a very simplified picture of how we can see the Saglasevania process difficulties manifesting in bill amendment. But I propose four different pathways for why we can see this knock-on effect of the, the difficulties of Saglasevania uh, and uh, driving behavior in the State Duma. But specifically in relation to your questions, I think two of them, two dynamics are important to, to focus on. One of them is that sometimes we have ministers who will consciously put on the table of cabinet a law that's a simplified version that excludes the controversial bits so that that ministry will get the sign off of other ministers. And this original minister will do that so that it can get signed off. It can be introduced in the state Duma. And the minister knows that in second reading, they can introduce all the controversial bits that they knew would have been blocked by their colleagues in cabinet. And the reason why they want to do that is because there is always an advantage in getting an initiative as far along the process as possible, because as soon as an initiative um, is fleshed out in second reading, uh, then it's very close to being adopted by the State Duma. Um, other dynamics can kick in um, uh, that mean that then it gains a certain momentum and these other executive actors will face difficulties in trying to block the passage of that beefed up, that now more controversial initiative um, uh, in the state Duma. That's not to say that sometimes other executive actors 
um, uh, can't block certain initiatives like that. That certainly will happen when other executive actors will realize the game that's being played and they will have to mobilize resources and, and mobilize partners to try and block that initiative. And so um, if you're on the State Duma archive website and you see a particular bill that has a second second reading, then that very often in my experience is what's going on. Um, other executive actors have clocked what's going on and they will try and see um, uh, that a bill does pass through to third reading with these more controversial elements introduced. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that a minister puts the whole bill to cabinet, but that other executive actors don't realize that they quite how much they disagree with the initiative because of the constraints, as I said, of time, resources, and policy expertise. And it's only when uh, the bill goes to the State Duma that they have the time, maybe they have resources because they have proxies within State Duma committees who can actually drill into the detail and work out and tell their uh, ministerial colleagues as to uh, what's going on, can point out that this initiative is not in fact aligned with the preferences of the ministry that didn't draft a certain initiative. So there are multiple different uh, pathways dynamics that would result in bill amendment and that's uh, only to focus on conflictual cases when we see differences and that uh, certainly was the dynamic that I presented within the presentation. There are other cases when a unified executive will want to um, amend bills as they pass through the Duma. And that can be because of shifting societal conditions uh, and, and various other dynamics. But certainly for the presentation, I think it's much more interesting to focus on these on these conflictual episodes. Okay, um, thank you for the uh, detailed answer. Uh, we have several questions here. Um, okay, so from Pavel, uh, is it necessary now for the bill to pass three readings in the Duma? I think uh, I, you've answered the questions in, the, uh, in your presentation a little bit, but can you elaborate more like why? These Certainly. Well, well, the uh, it's interesting. The um, initiative that I mentioned, Russia withdrawing from the Open Skies Treaty, that technically is well, not technically it is. Um, it relates to a ratification of a treaty, and so treaty ratifications don't have to pass through all three readings. They only have to pass through one reading. Um, uh, but maybe Pavel was thinking about whether these readings have to be spaced out over a certain amount of time or whether they can be clustered uh, into a short space of time. And there we've seen uh, the State Duma leadership willing in the past to break the rules uh, of the, the, the State Duma standing orders in order to pass certain initiatives that clearly um, uh, have a, a high level of importance attached to them from higher up. So there are lots of different ways in which the timetable can be sped up as well as being slowed down as a result of conflict. But procedurally, yes, Pavel, for um, most bits of normal legislation, they have to pass through the three readings. But sometimes we see, for example, the second and third reading taking place on the same day, because according to the State Duma Standing Orders, the third reading is, isn't really to another opportunity to introduce substantive amendments. It's just to make sure that all the language is correct, it is uh, legally and technically correct. Okay, um, the next question from Peter Solomon. Does your study show that some executive factions or interests tend to win out in the Saglasavania process, say at Pravidelstva, um, while others do better at the Duma? For example, do law enforcement agency or Siloviki do well at the government and not need to pursue their positions in the Duma? Thanks for the question, Peter. Uh, it's a question that I continue to ask myself and I do not have a satisfying response to. I wish I did, and it's certainly on my to-do list of ways to uh, move on from what I've done in this research project already. Um, one of the difficulties of coming to a satisfying answer that actually would reflect the different uh, abilities of actors to be, as you say, more successful in cabinet versus in the Duma relates to what I mentioned before about proxy lawmaking. So when these different executive actors will use non-executive actors to introduce initiatives, it's much, much trickier to tie those proxy initiatives um, introduced by deputies to these different executive actors. And because there are so many of those initiatives without having a clear handle on the linkages, the stable linkages between executive actors and their deputy proxies, it would be very tricky to work out whether executive actors are better 
at introducing uh, of getting their way in cabinet versus in the state Duma, just because of that problem of, uh, of identifying uh, when executive actors are the true sponsors of initiatives for these um, for these proxy initiatives. Uh, but Peter, if you have any ideas about how I might be able to get a better, better handle on that, uh, then please do let me know, because it's certainly something that has bugged me throughout the whole research project. I have tried to uh, look into more stable linkages between executive actors and deputy proxies. Certainly in a 2018 chapter that I co-authored with Katarina Schulman, we tried to look at um, these linkages so certain deputies would be the proxies for the Silovi Key, maybe for the Security Council, um, uh, but I don't yet have a good enough map that I would feel confident in using in order to navigate to be able to say okay deputy x has introduced an initiative that is a sign that the ministry of finance is trying to sneak in an initiative past their executive colleagues maybe i uh, we i can i want to ask a follow-up question from the solomon's question um so i i found that uh, from the news articles that sometimes prime minister or the president himself kind of comes in and the whole process of conflict and say that, okay, this is not good. And I'm going to side with this one, um, one side of the bill, or then, then he changes the, his position to take another side at the end. Like what is the role of the president and prime minister resolving this kind of like public conflicts made in the Duma? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I speak about at least one instance of it in the Comparative Political Studies article that I mentioned uh, that was published last year, where Putin um, intervenes and not necessarily because he wants to, but because there is so much pressure from these lower level executive actors for him to intervene, to decide if we see a stalemate, a sort of years and years of conflict over policy, they will look to Putin to be an arbiter, to make a decision. But what's fascinating about at least one of the cases that I mentioned in that paper is that Putin does intervene. That does mean that he, uh, in uh, I suppose we can think of as classic um, Putin style, doesn't pick a side. He goes for an option in the middle as a way of trying to satisfy everybody. Uh, but in that case, we see in the short term that a certain uh, uh, policy decision is reached. But it doesn't actually put the issue to bed. Uh, we see executive actors very soon after the policy de decision has been finalized by Putin's intervention saying, oh, well, we need to revisit this decision. Uh, and we see a change to uh, the policy subsequently. And in the book, I try to use this dynamic to explain why we see such volatility in legislation in Russia. It's because of these different interest groups sometimes getting their way because we have an intervention from uh, either the prime minister or the president, uh, but then uh, them not being satisfied, realizing that they can continue the battle and we can see the law changed the next month, six months later. I certainly know that Peter is familiar with a case that I think he alerted me to initially uh, relating to the criminal law of frequent U-turns. And when I looked into it, it was just a sign that we see these different um, uh, uh, groups um, battling with each other. Yes, they might lose this year, but they uh, uh, will uh, continue forward and try and change the law. And this is, I suppose, a, a, an example of uh, a dynamic that we see in democracies. You know, it, it, lots of what we're, um, what I focus on uh, in the state Duma, you could say, well, it's, it's, it's a very similar dynamic to what we would see. We see um, different interest groups competing over the content of policy, sometimes winning, sometimes losing, trying to revisit uh, something in the future. Um, uh, and so, yes, your prompt, Sunny, in, for the speaker series saying how institutions and lawmaking and the law can resemble, uh, when we're looking at Russia, um, the performance in consolidated liberal democracies. But are also, uh, I don't think we should take that too far. I'm not saying that the state Duma is a democratic legislature. I'm saying that it can have outcomes that don't conform to an ideal type rubber stamp. Uh, and sometimes the dynamics are very similar to democratic legislatures, but very often they're for distinctly authoritarian reasons. Um, I think you've just answered the next question that I was going to read from Yanni's the comparison between the US. Maybe we can talk about this again at the end. 
Okay. Um, compare like broadly, like how we see differences and similarities. Okay, and the next question uh, from Miller's, what about voting habits by United Russia members and whether they're two third majority, yeah. they're always unanimity? Yeah, great question. Uh, on the whole, United Russia is very good at imposing discipline when it comes to voting. Um, it's very good at, at whipping. And if any of, uh, of you are familiar with the State Duma and have seen pictures from plenary sessions, you will often see individuals standing at the front of the hall, uh, raising their hands, making certain gestures to make it clear to members how what the party line is, how they want to vote on certain issues. So uh, when I made the point about voting unanimity, that was in relation to all of the state Duma. And very often when we don't see unanimity, it's because the Communist Party or, or Just Russia or LDPR aren't voting the United Russia. If we were to focus only on United Russia, then the picture would be much, much closer to the expectations of unanimity. There are sometimes exceptions to that. And when that happens, it hits the news. You see that uh, references to a brave United Russia deputy who has voted against the party line. But it's not just within United Russia. There is another PR deputy called Sergei Ivanov. If you haven't heard of him and you're interested in uh, lawmaking in the state, do I encourage you to Google him. He really is an interesting character. Um, sometimes goes rogue, sometimes speaks with a level of, of what I regard as, as lifting um, the rug or pulling back the curtain, mixing metaphors about how things actually operate. He's willing to call a spade a spade in a way that is increasingly rare in the state Duma. And the last time I checked, it doesn't look as though the party has selected him to stand in the, se uh, the September election. So it could be that he's just overstepped the mark. Although I must say that that report of him not being included in the list um, is uh, a couple of months old. So um, that might have changed. But I wouldn't be surprised if he weren't selected by the party because he shows that maverick quality. But yes, United Russia, very disciplined, uh, very good at whipping deputies to vote in the way that the party wants. Okay, um, another question from Milos. Could some bill changes be explained for PR purposes from mm. the government to appease the public or international partners? Uh, I'll come back to it later. Or in a different regulation change through executive orders, local laws or so. This shows a semi-democratic influence of the public but is it just for show or um, executive uh, body still gets what it wants? Yeah, uh, another great question. Yes, sometimes we do see that quasi-democratic influence. If we have um, a, a resonant development within society, then we might see the executive uh, uh, be keen for a change to be made to an initiative in order to respond to um, that development in society. And it isn't just a, uh, in relation to amendment. With the school shooting in Kazan, we've seen uh, lawmaking focusing on tighter restrictions on weapons in Russia. And that very much is a sign that lawmaking in Russia can be responsive to social concerns of the day. Um, so in a sense, that is a responsiveness of the executive to dynamics in society. And it's not necessarily for show. They're not just doing it because uh, they think it's a PR exercise. I think um, that certainly for certain executive actors, they want to do it because they think actually it's going to make for better policy. Uh, so I'd be very reluctant to say that all of that is for PR. Your second question about tracking the influence of, of civil society and whether they can have uh, more influence within uh, ministries or within the state Duma. That again is another fascinating question that I have thought about. Uh, it kept me up uh, late at night, many a night, thinking about how would you, how would I tap into that exhaustively? Again, in the chapter that I uh, wrote with Katarina Schulman, we have a, a few examples where it seems as though civil society organizations have been able to lobby for their interests, to lobby for changes to initiatives when they're passing through the state Duma. But we also see those same actors saying, actually, if you want something done, the best thing to do is to be aware of initiative being developed by a ministry and go in at that stage. So I think when you speak to civil society actors on the ground, they would want to uh, try and get to the executive first because they know that's when they can make the most impact. If they're not able to access uh, the ministry, if they're not aware that an initiative is being developed by a ministry, um, or if they're unsuccessful in trying to lobby 
that ministry, then it will just, they'll shift to the later stage in the Duma. And that might, as I say, be because they only become aware of an initiative when it's um, uh, introduced into the state Duma. And I should uh, make that broader point that one of the reasons why the state Duma is important, um, uh, ignoring everything else, is because that is the public portion of the lawmaking process. So even though these um, executive disagreements can rage on for years, lots of people don't know about it. Uh, partly because of this reluctance to air dirty laundry, but just by the nature of policymaking in any type of policy, democratic or authoritarian, the parliamentary stage is by its nature, by design, public, and that can provide opportunities for uh, civil society actors. But as I have mentioned in the presentation, it can also make other executive actors aware of certain elements of initiatives that they uh, don't agree with. But Milos, certainly uh, I uh, it's uh, something that I want to carry on um, uh, looking at in the future, trying to compare the uh, abilities of civil society actors to influence the lawmaking process. Um, so I don't have uh, a, a proportion to report now or, or uh, research results to report now, but I hope to be able to in the next few years. Mm. Uh, in relation to the uh, responsiveness of the Duma to the public pressure and um, so civil society, you mentioned uh, maybe it is not part of the main um, uh, research focus, but you also mentioned that there is a uh, venue for um, the debate during the Duma session in the second and the third reading and the, like, the length of the debate and how the deputies from especially from opposition, systemic opposition party engage. Uh, through the public debate in the Duma, and sometimes they grill the um, executive actor who is presenting mm -hmm. his bill. Like, how how would you evaluate um, the impact, the actual impact of having that kind of public debate in uh, revising any um, any contents of the bills? When it comes to the plenary sessions, that's when I think when we get closer to the the PR take. Um, yes, you can sometimes have people like Sergey Ivanov who will stand up and say something controversial. Um, but I really don't think that that has um, very much of uh, an impact into how um, everyday Russian citizens think about politics uh, uh, insofar as they uh, think about politics or how they evaluate the state Duma. We know that broadly speaking, according to Levada Center data, um, that lots of Russians have a very low opinion of the state Duma, that they do think that it's a peripheral body um, uh, that maybe it is full of self-serving individuals. And even if they're honest individuals, all they're doing is uh, implementing the wishes of people elsewhere. And so insofar as Russian people want to think about politics, then they won't be thinking about the state Duma. In those plenary sessions, certainly the example I showed, that was a bit of uh, set piece theater, I'm sure. Valodin um, uh, uh, knew what he wanted to do with Aryeshkin. Uh, he knew that it was gonna be this moment where he could say, I'm the boss here. You might be a member of the government, but, but this is my domain. Um, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to show you up. And, you know, uh, more recent bits of set political theatre, when Valentina Tereshkova stood up during the second reading of Putin's constitutional reform bill, that was clearly a set piece of political theatre, even though uh, officially people said, no, it was her spontaneous um, wish to introduce this change. And she said that people had implored her to introduce this amendment. I think it's now very clear that that was all set up. So when it comes to plenary sessions, they are, um, uh, probably less informative for what's going on, although I think they can give some indication of whether a bill is controversial or not. Unfortunately, the most consequential venues, the committees, um, do not, they're not open. So it's not as if I can get a transcript of committee discussions. If I could, that would be gold dust, but uh, just by design. Um, and again, this isn't actually that rare that parliamentary committees will be closed, whereas it's plenary sessions that are open again by design, by nature. But uh, uh, insofar as sometimes committee uh, transcripts or details from committee dis um, uh, discussions are leaked through journalists, then they can provide really um, important insights into what's being discussed uh, behind closed doors. If I'm talking about other bits of information that I'd 
give my eye teeth to get. It would be the table of disagreements that are put together. So during the sign off process, when you have the ministry who will say, we've drafted this bit of uh, legislation, what do you think before we can send it to the state Duma? They put together these tables of disagreements where other ministries will comment on an initiative and say, well, we like this, but we don't like this, 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 this. And that would be great to have because that would, you know, thinking as a political scientist would, would, would provide information on the level of disagreement or agreement within the executive and looking at a similar scholarship to what I do in Russia in democracies um, by accessing uh, information on the extent to which ministries agree with each other or not. Very often that will relate to different ministries being controlled by different political parties and so political scientists will look at how close these parties are ideologically speaking, which will then give a sense about how close the ministries are in terms of policy preferences. And that can be a way into trying to measure intra-executive actionism. I can't do that, uh, unfortunately, which is why the intra-executive element of my story in the book project is very much dependent on the case studies. It's not introduced in the econometric analysis. Uh, uh, but again, it's another one of those elements that I'm, I, I still think about ways in which I can come up with a proxy that would allow me to do that. But I realize that's a, a rambling answer. So I'll, 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 I'll be quiet now and we can maybe move on to the next one. Okay. Um, so a question from Pavel. Um, how do you feel about the 2020 amendment to the constitution? How do I feel about them? Well, uh, I don't have a, a normative position on them, but let me speak about them insofar as they relate to parliamentary politics. When President Vladimir Putin stood up on the 15th of January 2020 to give his address to the Federal Assembly, of course, most of that speech wasn't about constitutional change. He only spoke about constitutional change in the very last portion. But in that portion, he said that the State Duma would uh, be receiving more powers, that it would become more important, that I suppose in the language of the speaker series blurb, it may be given the opportunity to be more autonomous. And that was, as you can imagine, him speaking to the Federal Assembly, that went down very well in the transcript. I think we have um, uh, lots of applause at that moment, uh, if not people standing up with applause. So on the 15th of January, one of the messages was these constitutional changes are to empower parliament, to make it a more meaningful actor within the policy process. But uh, as I discuss in the article that I mentioned that I co-authored with Nikolai Petrov, which came out in um, Russian politics, the general Russian politics uh, about a month or so ago, we show how actually in the process of adopting the constitution, never mind the legislation that implements the new constitutional language, that just shows how hollow that promise was. Uh, um, so uh, in adopting these constitutional changes, it was clear that the state Duma wasn't having a strengthened role. It role. If anything, including in combination with the pandemic, the state Duma was playing even less of a role in scrutinizing these initiatives, in um, uh, holding the executive to account. So purely focusing on uh, the state Duma's role in the constitutional amendments and what President Putin mentioned in January 2020, it's difficult to be optimistic about these constitutional changes. I think we haven't seen an empowering of parliament and it's unlikely that we're going to see that in the near future. Although of course, all of that depends on what happens in, in September in the state Duma elections. Although from the analysis that I've seen so far, it does seem likely that United Russia will re-secure a majority, if not a super majority, um, uh, and so I think the picture that I've told um, will likely continue through to the Eighth Convocation. Actually, Paul asked um, the direct question to your um, uh, perspective on the September uh, election. Do you think we may move into a more dynamic period after the Duma elections in September? What might be the possible range of options for Duma dynamics in the next few years? Great question, Paul. Uh, yeah, we really are in the territory of speculation, but insofar as you've given me the opportunity to do it, um, rather than give an answer, I will say what it's going to depend on. It's, of course, going to depend on United Russia's seat share. It's going to depend on whether Vyacheslav Volodin remains speaker. There was a period um, at the end of last year where I think a number of people thought that he wouldn't be staying as speaker. Although I must say 
uh, my contacts in Russia now suggest that he might be staying on. And if he's staying on, then he will bring the um, a political heft that he has brought to the State Duma and probably try and continue his project to make the State Duma his domain and try and use every opportunity to make actors, um, political actors, take it seriously. Uh, another variable that we have to pay attention to is the composition uh, of the deputies, so who they are. We know that the Kremlin has been keen for the candidates that are standing for United Russia um, uh, to be actually supported by uh, Russian citizens. And so that reduces the need of the authorities to rely on other forms of, manipula uh, to forms of manipulation, um, including electoral falsification. And so we've seen uh, people standing in the United Russia primaries who are celebrities, who have name recognition. Uh, and so part of uh, my response to your uh, question, uh, Paul, and you can probably tell I'm not going to give you a substantive one, is to say it depends on quite how many, what proportion of the new um, uh, membership, of the, well, of the membership of the convocation are going to be the social notables versus um, uh, the lawyers, the businessmen. Um, so I think lots of, the, of what the uh, Duma actually does in the Eighth Convocation is going to depend on that. And also it's going to depend on what the Kremlin does after the elections. If it gets the results it wants, and this is real speculation, so uh, please don't hold me to it if I get it wrong, or please do hold me uh, to it if I get it wrong. But we know that one of the reasons why the Kremlin is cracking down so hard on opposition right now is because they need a good result in September, because the eighth convocation will span 2024, which is when the next presidential election is scheduled to take place. And once the Kremlin if, as it's highly likely, the Kremlin gets the results that it wants, that provides some level of systemic stability. And we might see then some type of thaw afterwards. Although, as I say, that's pure speculation, but it's certainly something that I'll be looking at to see, whether we see a certain sense of relaxation from the Kremlin uh, and less repression. Um, although, I'm, as I say, I, I'm, I'm very cautious about that. I'm not saying that that's what I expect. I just think that it's a possibility that we have to be prepared for. Uh, another question from Kimberly. Does your yep. argument apply to the Federal Federation Council too? Specifically in fall 2020, uh, the council visited Nord Nickel after the terrible fuel spill and publicly criticizes oligarch leaders. Uh, do you have mm -hmm. any sense why the council was chosen to do this? Great question. So if we're thinking about rubber stamps, then just by its nature and its position in the lawmaking process, the Federation Council is closer to being uh, a rubber stamp. As a body, it has less of an important role to play. You can't amend a bill while it's being considered in the Federation Council. Uh, the Federation Council and senators can be involved in the second reading. They can be involved in the, in the State Duma uh, process. So for example, if a senator wants to introduce an amendment, they can send that amendment to the committee responsible for a bill and uh, the committee will decide about whether they want to propose to the Duma in plenary to adopt or reject that particular Amendments. So senators can play an important role in the lawmaking process, but when it comes to the Federation Council as a whole and that stage of the lawmaking process after the three readings in the State Duma, then it has less of a meaningful role, which is why in the book project I don't discuss it very much. Uh, but it's a fascinating case that you point to when we see the Federation Council being used to criticise um, uh, members of the economic elite. And certainly in the example that you point to, one of the clear logics is uh, that it might be awkward for Putin himself to, um, uh, to scold these oligarchs, although as we know uh, from uh, Russian history, he has been able and willing to do that. But in certain circumstances, we can see uh, Putin relying sometimes on the government, sometimes on the Federation Council, sometimes on the state Duma to be the bad cop to his I'm all above it cop. Um, uh, and that's sometimes why we see Valentina Matvienka being the bad cop standing up and saying, no, this is unacceptable, things have to change, um, because we see that uh, reputational but also involvement buffer, uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, legislative actors can sometimes be instrumentalised um, by uh, Putin, by the presidential administration also um, in these particular incidents. Uh, although I should say, Kimberly, that that particular episode I didn't follow closely, 
um, uh, but other episodes like it um, that make me think that actually that's it, it's very much uh, uh, the dynamic that I just suggested that these are uh, uh, legislative actors being used um, uh, so that Putin doesn't have to intervene in situations that might be quite awkward um, or that he doesn't want to be uh, blamed for if things go wrong. And it's certainly why sometimes even the presidential administration will use deputy proxies. So it's not always ministries, sometimes the presidential administration or the Security Council doesn't want to be closely associated with an initiative, either because it's unpopular or because they're unsure about what the societal reaction will be. And so deputy proxies can be used as that reputational buffer. I realize it's slightly uh, far away from the example that you pointed to, but it just gave me an opportunity to speak about another reason why we see proxies used to provide that, that distance, um, the plausible deniability. Okay, um, from Peters, are there any, um, some kinds of draft laws that merit or require vetting within the presidential administration? So uh, special categories of legislation. Um, well, that will depend on uh, the standing orders, both within the presidential administration within the State Duma, but also the government. Um, but certainly there are uh, high profile bits of legislation that we often see being sponsored by the presidential administration, but that's rarely a case of it being a formal requirement and more that the presidential administration both wants to be the main driver of that bit of legislation. Um, uh, uh, or it's in, in the best position uh, to be able to develop that particular initiative. There's an example that I speak about in the book project where the investigative committee put together a draft bit of legislation. It took it to the government and said, uh, uh, um, uh, Bastrykin, uh, the head of the investigative um, uh, uh, committee, said, uh, I have this draft uh, legislation. Will you introduce it into the State Duma? And the ministers looked at it and said, no, we don't like it. And the ministers thought, right, that's it. Uh, Bastrykin's going to go away with his tail between his legs. But all he did, he went to the presidential administration and he said, I've got this initiative. Do you want to introduce it into the state duma for me? And the presidential administration said yes. And you can imagine the surprise that the ministers had when they saw this initiative that they thought they'd rejected being introduced by the presidential administration. Uh, so uh, there are multiple reasons why the presidential administration would want to uh, introduce a certain type of initiative. And as I mentioned before, that could be because of prestige, it could be because of the presidential administration's capacity, but it can also be because um, other actors are using the presidential administration um, uh, because they've been unsuccessful in getting cabinet to agree to introduce it into the state Duma by themselves. Um, uh, but certainly, say, when it comes to important electoral legislation, very often we see that introduced by um, the president. Uh, but it can vary. Um, sometimes I'm surprised by the bits of uh, legislation, uh, draft legislation that are introduced by the presidential administration. I would think, well, that wouldn't that make more sense um, for the government to introduce? Um, uh, but there, there, sometimes there does seem to be a logic in terms of uh, these high profile political changes. Uh, or not. Although, Peter, if you have, um, if there's another question lurking behind that question, as in you want uh, uh, me to give a sense about whether uh, you should be looking at the presidential administration for a certain category of um, uh, draft uh, initiatives, then um, uh, uh, please do get in touch and I'll try, I'll try and look into it in a bit more detail. Okay, the last question from the audience. Um, Anna, mm, which laws pass recently have surprised you the most? <laughs> Surprise me in what sense? I, it's interesting. I usually, uh, until the middle of 2020, maybe the end of 2020, felt quite able to keep on top of things, to have a sense of which uh, draft initiatives were being introduced of note that it would be worthwhile tracking. I used the word flurry a couple of times in the presentation and it really was a flurry, so much so that for me as an observer what's going on in the Duma, it was overwhelming. The barrage of repressive legislation that individually would have been surprising, but together it almost you desensitize, uh, it desensitizes observers as to what's going on. And I think that was by design at the end of 2020, we saw a shock and awe tactic by the presidential administration, um, by the executive more broadly to introduce these initiatives that would, they hoped, send a chilling effect throughout the political opposition that would frustrate the activities of independent investigative journalists. 
And so the, the worrying response to your answer, Anna, is that I'm less surprised now because we seem to have passed so many red lines. Um, uh, there is so much that is surprising that now I, I just, um, it, it takes, it would take quite a lot to shock me. And that's a very worrying state of affairs to be in because if, if I spend lots of my time doing my research, studying what's going on in the state Duma, and I can't keep track of what's going in, then what are uh, Russian citizens? supposed to do. And yes, I'm not saying that in order for the State Duma to be a real parliament, every Russian citizen should be able to, to keep up with what's going on, but they should be able to understand, broadly speaking, um, what's being discussed, and they should uh, have opportunities to be able to challenge and maybe support certain initiatives. The way that the State Duma is operating now, that's certainly not taking place. And that's another indication that uh, this is a body that isn't functioning uh, in a way that a parliament uh, should function. Uh, in a society that calls itself democratic. Okay, maybe um, as like to wrap up the whole talk, um, we, we can maybe go back to the question from Yanis, can we compare, um, can we do any comparative analysis with the US and democratic system uh, versus the, the, the authoritarian institution as in state Duma? Um, so can we, I, I, I make, it might sound a very benign question, but, um, if we measure the autonomy of the state Duma in, in a sense that how democratic systems work, uh, to what extent, uh, given your presentation and the talk and the Q&A session today, it seems likely that autonomy is rather located in um, maybe executive actors using the legislative uh, institutions rather than the mm -hmm. um, state Duma itself. So how would you mm -hmm. say to that? And what, would, uh, what is your prospect and conclusion in terms of the main question. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, Yanis, for the question. Uh, certainly, when, if you think about the case study bill that I point to, where it goes from two pages to 65 pages, we know that that happens all the time in Congress. But that what's happening there is we see horse trading. Uh, we see um, uh, different members of, of Congress who are using the opportunity of a bill um, to get their own way, to say, OK, I'll support you on this element if you introduce um, a, a, a certain uh, um, a detail that I want added. And that's why we can see the creation of omnibus bills. And that's a very, very familiar story. But there the story is of parliamentarians as representatives of geographical as well as societal and economic constituencies uh, using the process in order to um, realize their goals. What we see in the State Duma is less of that. We're not seeing parliamentarians actually influencing what's going on, being responsible for the log rolling. It very much is a story about the executives. And let me now, insofar as I'm not American and I'm much more familiar with what happens in Westminster, link my research to some research also done by a scholar at UCL, Meg Russell, where she looked at Westminster, which is often referred to as a rubber stamp parliament. We have a very strong executive insofar as we have a parliamentary system. There are institutional reasons why the relationship between the executive and the legislature is different to what we would see in a presidential system like the US or a semi-presidential system like um, a formerly semi-presidential system like we see in Russia. But what's fascinating is that um, Professor Russell looks at cases of bill amendments and the story there, even though Westminster is called a rubber stamp parliament, uh, and even though lots of these amendments formally are introduced by the executive, actually ideationally, the ideas, the content of these amendments very often are in response to opposition proposals. So the government of the day will see the opposition proposing amendments and it will say, OK, we're going to reject that amendment. But then they just take the idea and introduce it in their own name as well so they can gain all the reputational advantages. So there we have Professor Russell's scholarship pushing back against the rubber stamp picture for Westminster. But it's still when you look at what's happening, um, a relationship between opposition and government in power. I also see amendments which push back against the rubber stamp picture, uh, in my case of the State Duma, but it very much isn't a picture of opposition versus the government. It's about actors within the executive. Um, mm -hmm. So certainly I'm always very keen to think about the parallels and the differences between my research and consolidated liberal democracies, because I think it's a really important conversation to have. And I'm pleased that this 
literature more broadly is speaking about it more openly, thinking less about authoritarian politics and, uh, and, and political institutions and democratic and realizing the ways in which they can resemble um, each other. Uh, but as I would say, uh, at least from the research that I presented, um, focusing on the ways in which they're dissimilar is equally as important. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for um, sharing your research and the insight into how um, the Russian lawmaking and the policymaking works between executive um, actors and the Duma. Um, it was a great insight and great expertise that we've gained from Dr. Noble today. Um, and thank you audience members uh, for sticking us until the end. And thank you Carly for organizing this event behind the scenes. Let me make a brief note on the next upcoming speaker series event, which is on June 3rd. We're inviting Professor Catherine Handley from University of Wisconsin to talk about uh, judicial independence in Russia. If you're interested in this topic, please join us again here on June 3rd. We shall see you there and then again soon. Um, thank you again, Dr. Venn. Um, thank you, Sunny. It was pleased to have you here with us and thank you everybody. Um, uh, goodbye, thank you.